do the webcam. We live? Okay, welcome everyone to the first and hopefully the only virtual QCNR uh, retreat. Uh, today we're broadcasting this portion of the program over a YouTube streaming channel, and so hopefully you're all there. I see about 50 people online, so that's so that sounds pretty good. Uh, Brian Karchner is kind of running things from the control room, and so uh, we'll, we'll have that. If you run into some problems, Tracy is here, and you can call her phone at 435-757-5180. Uh, Tracy's also going to be here monitoring the chat line that should be somewhere on your screen and obvious. And so if you have questions or whatever, that's how we can interact today over this. Uh, we don't, we probably won't have time for all the questions and to answer all of those, but we are planning to have a town hall meeting on September 10th at 3. And that'll be after we've been teaching for a little while and there'll be lots of different questions and we'll have a variety of folks here who can answer that at that time. And we'll see how that goes. Uh, let's see, the agenda today, I'm going to start out and um, talk a little bit about how things ended up last spring and give a brief update. And then we're going to hear from Shelly and then Ricky and then Emily, and they'll make presentations from their various units. And then I'll come back at the end and we can talk a little bit about the future uh, looking at what's happening with COVID, the budget cuts we recently put in, BNR models, um, remodeling programs, and then how we're going to how we're going to proceed. And then at ten fifteen, everybody will have their department retreats um, that you can tune in, and hopefully you've all gotten good information on that. Okay, let's see. Next slide, I guess. Um, as dean, my role, I think, is really twofold. One is to provide some leadership, and so I'm not sure that's the right picture of leadership, but we'll, we'll give it a whirl. Um, these days, it's tricky to figure out what that is, but one of the things that I'm going to stress this semester is to try to communicate better and more frequently. And so Tracy and I will be setting up a Monday um, news brief that we're going to send out to everybody over email that'll give some some updates and, and hopefully that'll help with some of the communication on any of these different topics that are happening. Uh, another part of my job is going to be to enact some short-term policies that help keep us all safe during this uh, COVID pandemic and we'll see how that works. I think one of the tricks this semester is going to be to stay flexible because we're not exactly sure how this is going to play out. So um, so we'll be working on that. And then hopefully I can provide some leadership by example and, and actually I think you guys will all be important in terms of leading by example to your students and, and staff. So, so that'll be important. Uh, the second task that I see for the dean's um, role in the college is to provide some financial oversight, some fiscal oversight, and Brandon, if we can have the next slide. Um, this is just a, a brief pie chart that um, we put out every year that gives sort of a, a summary of where the sources of money come from in the college. Um, the E and G part, the blue part of that um, pie, is what we get from the state every year, and it's about a third of our total. It remains about that from year to year. It bounces around a little bit. This year was a little different in that we had a budget cut, and I'll talk a little bit about that near the, near the end. Uh, we also have a very active advancement program where we get philanthropic gifts, um, and that's what's in the yellow uh, triangle. And Emily um, is going to talk a little bit about that in the past, and she'll give an update on, on what happened this last year, and also um, things that are going to change as we move into the future. It's an exciting time for advancement, and so Emily Blake will fill us in on that. Uh, and then um, the biggest part of our budgets, and, and really uh, the heart of our college in many ways, is our research program. Um, you can see it, it occupies about 60% of the total budget. And Brian, if you can go to the next slide, we can take a look at that. 
These, this is a, a graph, the histogram is uh, simply a graph of the grant dollars brought in by faculty in the college each year. You can see that that bounces around quite a bit. We had a real dip um, two years ago and we're coming out of that. We still haven't gotten back to where we were in FY16. Fiscal year 16 was a little unusual and it was a little bit higher than, than any, any year in the past. And so um, we'll see where that is. But in general, things are, are uh, looking good. Um, one of the things that always impresses me when I look at college finances is just how diverse our funding sources are. And you can see that pie chart with a variety of different, different um, components. The federal research agencies provide us um, with about 60% of the total research budget, and the rest of that is mostly state-funded things, but also a variety of other kinds of things. Some of them are foundations, other universities collaborate with us, um, and uh, other states are, are funding our work as well. And so that's, um, that's a tremendous sense of diversity and a, and a large amount of money. It always impresses me how well faculty do with our research program. Uh, each faculty member on average is bringing in $200,000 a year in research. These are um, monies that are used to run, basically every faculty is running a small business. And uh, we, one of our problems I think is that is in grad school, we never get any training on how to run a business. And so it always takes us a little while to get that figured out, but people do a, a, an amazingly good job. The per capita research productivity of our colleges one of the highest in the university, depending on how you calculated it, 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 I can make it the highest if I calculate it in the right way. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I greatly appreciate your efforts on the research front. Almost everybody has a research program. Um, your efforts and diligence and uh, are very important to the work that we do, and we promote healthy ecosystems and enhance the use of wildlands by the public. And so it's it's important work that we do. And it, it's must, because of this that I'm very proud to, to serve as your dean. Uh, this is probably a good time to see if there's any chat questions. And I don't know what's happening in terms of that. If anybody has questions, we can look at that now. We're going to have these. Um, these slides sent out to everybody, um, and so it's easy to for you to look at those in more detail as we go. Um, anyway, any, any questions in general? I don't know how, how much the delay is on the chat. I don't think it's too terrible. Yeah, let's give it a couple seconds. Brian wants me to wait just a minute, so we we'll get to do that. Uh, we can go back to the um, agenda. And next, we're going to hear from Shelly. Shelly is going to talk with us a little bit about graduation numbers during our virtual graduation. Sorry, Shelly, next month, it looks like the DWR funding is down substantially. Is this a continuing trend? Um, yeah, uh, Terry, it's a little tricky figuring things out. Part of it has to do with what faculty are doing. Um, I'll try to send out something in the information that we have on that. I can go back and look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, it's, I'm not sure that it's really that, that much less. Um, it kind of depends on, on how we count collaborations and various other things. The DNR and DWR funding kind of flips around a little bit too, so I'll try to do that. Um, Okay, so Shelly is going to come and talk with us about graduation numbers and also enrollments for the coming year. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so the Academic Service and Advising Center at QCNR, we're, um, we play the major role in serving undergrad students in a variety of ways. And we can also help faculty. So if anyone ever has a question as far as resources on campus for undergraduate students, we're definitely can provide that answer or find someone who can. So let us know if we can help in, in that way. Um, and I wanna focus a bit this morning on, um, on enrollment numbers, because this was sort of the, um, I think administrators across campus and people across campus were really wondering how this pandemic was gonna affect our enrollments this fall. 
Um, so I'm going to spend some time talking about that a bit this morning. Why don't you go to the next one? Um, as you can see, actually, QCNR undergraduate, I'm going to be talking undergraduate numbers mostly. Um, as you can see, our fall enrollment numbers have actually increased quite a bit this fall for us. 20 students um, is, is a significant jump. Um, and um, this, this is actually happening across, across all colleges at USU for the undergraduate enrollment on the Logan campus. So those numbers last I heard, we're seeing about a 7% increase um, on Logan campus undergraduate students. We're kind of flat across the university overall, and that's due to enrollments dropping with statewide campuses and graduate programs. But our undergraduate programs are doing really well. Um, although today is the day that um, students are being dropped from courses due to non-payment, and so I think there is a little worry that the bottom's going to fall out of everything today, so we'll see. Hopefully that's not the case. Um, I, th I think we're going to be okay. Um, that's my personal thought on it. Uh, let's go to the next one, Brian. So, and you can also see here, this breaks things down by departments and where we're at, and really, um, the main increase that's, a, that's affecting the college increase is happening in the Department of, of Wildland Resources. You can see that jump um, pretty significant from fall of 2019 to 2020 for the Wildland Resources Department. Everybody else is kind of hanging in there about where we were the year before. Um, and then I'll pop to the next slide, Brian. And here's, here's some things that are affecting wild. Um, our forestry program has grown significantly in the last three years. Um, so we're, we're definitely, and that's great. We wanted that. We were focused on that a bit and we've been wanting that to happen. So um, I think this is really good news and hopefully we'll continue to see that program grow. Uh, the, next, the next program that's also seen a significant increase is the wild, wildlife ecology and management major. Um, and we're kind of back up to we, where we were in fall of 2016. I don't know, those folks may remember we put some math placement, um, or sorry, some math prerequisites in place um, to sort of help bring those numbers down a bit and um, get students in appropriate majors. And we're seeing, we saw that trend kind of level out for a few years and now we're growing again. Um, and I think we're gonna see that continue to grow probably. So next slide. Here's a bit of a comparison by major. Some of some um, thought this would be interesting for folks all across campus, faculty advisors, people teaching in these different programs. Um, you can kind of see where we are. Again, our our main increases are in wildlife, forestry, and um, and yeah, and and uh, a little bit in. Um, in, in rec resource, sorry. Okay, next slide. Um, and then it, this is some numbers for everyone to take a look at with the MNR program. We, we are seeing, um, this is the graduation rates for the last couple of years. We had a, a bit of a drop in 2020. Although I know, as I understand, um, Melanie has been really working hard to get a lot of students admitted this fall. And so I imagine we'll be seeing this trend go back up in the next few years. I know she's had a lot of applications this fall. Um, and one last slide. And then here's our um, GIS certificate completion. So we've definitely still seen a lot of involvement in the GIS program, and I believe that's also enrollments are continuing to go up there, and those classes are full. Um, if anyone has any questions about numbers, this stuff will go out with all the other um, slides for the presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions if we need to take a minute. Okay. So Shelly, while that's while we're waiting on um, any chats, um, it always strikes me that when we hire new faculty we get more majors in the next few years. Yeah. And I think in forestry we recently hired people and also in wildlife we recently hired people. Yeah. So that's do you think that's part yeah. of what's going on? Yeah, I do. I think that's um, I think that's a good thing to, to note. Yeah, we've definitely seen an enthusiasm for the forestry program, and I think that's definitely connected to Larissa and Jim and, and Justin's work. Yeah, for sure. So it's great. But I'm getting lots of students coming in 
very excited about hearing um, the three of you talk. So it's it's excellent. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Next, we have Ricky Downs, and he's going to give us an update on the Business Service Center. Uh, it's a, an area that's been impacted a lot by the COVID situations, and so he'll describe that uh, a little bit. So here's Ricky. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I didn't bring any slides with me. I've known that you have a choice between looking at my face or slides I would have brought to <laughs> So the first thing I want to do is to uh, recognize and, and introduce uh, a new employee that uh, we have in business services. Back in April after Kay uh, left us and went over to environmental, uh, or ENVS, we uh, went and hired Anna Afoka. She comes uh, to us from Texas and although she hasn't been in the office very much and no one has, uh, most of you have probably had some interface with her through emails. Uh, she's the, currently the PCARD administrator for us and we hope she stays with us for a while. She's doing a great job. It's always hard to figure out uh, what to present to this group. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to bring up is maybe something that we haven't talked a lot about in the past, but and that's the fringe benefit rate. Uh, a couple of days ago, the controller's office issued their semi-annual update of fringe, fringe benefit rates. And just so everyone's aware, what we do is we have two sets of rates, one set is to be used for the next six months, and th those are the what they call the actual rates to get applied to the to the labor dollars and to go into all of your accounts as actual expenses. And the second set of rates is the rates that are used for proposals, and those rates are, are by fiscal year and cover a five-year period, and. So normally what the controller's office tries to do is to keep the actual rates just a little bit lower than the proposal rates. So when you have contracts and grants, you have a little bit of a buffer. So uh, like I said, the new rates came out uh, the day before yesterday. And there was quite a surprise, at least it was a surprise to me, the, the actual rate has gone from uh, the past six months, we were at 44.4%, and it jumped up 1.5 percentage points, which is quite significant. So now we're in a little over 46%. Most of that increase is due to health care, which I guess probably isn't surprising. So, the repercussions of that is that because of such a large increase, uh, whereas in the past uh, a lot of times you had a little bit of a buffer zone between what was getting applied to your to your contracts and grants and what they were budgeted at, now it's actually reversed. So you might have had uh, fringe benefits budgeted at say forty. 5% and now you're actually going to be, get, be getting hit with a 46% rate. So I just wanted to let everyone be aware of that. Uh, there's not much we can do about it, but it will put some pressure on ongoing budgets uh, and we'll have to see what happens in the next six months. So that's one thing I wanted to cover. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is that I think for the last two years, when we've met, we've always talked about the fact that we wanted to uh, meet quarterly with faculty members to go over their finances, their contracts and grants, their other indexes, and make sure everything was working properly, hoping that uh, by doing so we could 
uh, become more efficient, not having to do things repetitively, make fewer reallocations and, and journal entries to clean things up. Uh, I must admit we haven't done a very good job of that over the past two years. We've been caught up with doing other stuff. But I think uh, in the past month uh, we've started those up again. Uh, Kathy Allen is doing a great job of getting those organized and uh, scheduled. And I'm hoping that uh, this year we will be meeting on a regular basis with all faculty and reviewing their accounts and trying to keep current on those and hopefully that will provide better service to everyone. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, some of the things we've seen on the proposal uh, sponsor program side. I want everybody to remember that when you get documents uh, from sponsors uh, and they need signatures, uh, no one has in the college has uh, signature authority. And anytime it's looking for a signature, you need to make sure those documents get either to, you can send them to us and we'll make sure they get uh, forwarded on to sponsored programs so we can get uh, the authorized signatures on those. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that uh, I know there's been some frustration with uh, PIs and faculty on business services not getting back to them on issues. And in order to try to streamline things, I wanted to this morning just review the proposal process that is in place. And some of you have, or should be familiar with it, but either have forgotten about that or and some of you are new, so new, so we'll try to go over that. So, one thing we do have that is the key to proposal preparation is it's called the proposal development request form. And you can't see this, but here it is, and it's out on our on our website. And anytime you have a grant, whether it's new money or uh, a new grant or if it's going to be uh, amendments to a current contract, anytime you're having additional money added to your accounts, we need to go through this process and you need to submit to us a proposal development request form which has on it uh, some basic information about the, about the PI, about the sponsor information, budgeting, um, and a request for a statement of work. And once we get that, then we can make sure that that uh, gets processed and gets into quality so that you can have uh, those monies approved and, and added to your accounts. So uh, we can, if you don't know where to find that uh, link, we can send something out to everyone to make sure they know what that link to the proposal development form is and how to use that. So I think that's really all I wanted to cover. If we have questions, uh, I'm ready for them. So there's about a 30 second delay. So okay. Just, okay. So, so Ricky, um, I don't know where the microphone is on this, but um, what kind of lead time do you need yeah, that's, as, that's as, you know, as there's a due date or an agency, and then how does that play out? Because I know that's really difficult sometimes. Yeah, right now we have, uh, we're really busy, and we've got probably at least a dozen uh, proposals in queue at any given time. And so uh, we would really prefer having at least two weeks advance if you could get things to us two weeks before they actually need to be submitted to the sponsor, that would be great. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you have opportunities come up and you don't have two weeks, you know, we will try to accommodate you. And I think in the past, I, I'm pretty sure that the list of 
opportunities we've actually missed because of not getting it in on time are fairly few and, and so two weeks is, is what we would like to see and that should give us enough time to get everything through the system. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay, next, Emily Blake is going to give us an update on development. Um, I keep calling Emily our new development officer. She's been here about nine months now almost. Is that right? Eight? Yeah. yeah, something like that. So it's not exactly new. So I should quit calling her that. <laughs> um, but she's been doing a great job, and she's going to talk a little bit about activities that um, she's been involved with up till now, and then also uh, what's happening in the future. We're seeing big changes in how advancement is run at the university. Emily's going to update us on that. Thanks. Great. Uh, like Chris said, I've been here um, almost a year now, uh, not completely new to the college. I actually graduated from this college, so um, some of you might remember me from classes. Uh, and then I, I worked at Stokes Nature Center immediately after that. So. I know a lot of you uh, from the community, but uh, looking forward to working with you in this role. Um, so we can pop to the first slide. Um, the next one. Um, so like Chris said, uh, USU has really been in investing in advancement. So we have a new vice president in the advancement office, um, and the physical space for the advancement office is over in the Welcome Center. Um, so the VP is Matt White, um, and he's done a really great job of allocating um, more resources, whether that's people power, um, different softwares for us to use, um, and more collaboration across units. So maybe we have an alumni um, of our college whose spouse is in the College of Arts um, that I'm, I'm working with my counterpart in um, the College of Arts to, to make it a more donor-centric environment. Um, so as USU invests um, in advancement, we're seeing a lot of growth in that area. Um, a lot of the other colleges have uh, two or three development uh, officers or a larger development team, um, where our college has uh, myself and then Tracy and um, Janelle or the student worker are really instrumental in um, helping with stewardship. Um, so as you kind of saw from budget cuts and um, kind of a strange uh, environment that we're in right now, philanthropy is more important than ever. We're hoping um, to kind of bridge some of those gaps between budget cuts or uh, students losing summer work and they're not able to pay for um, fall semester or some of, some of the financial things that come with um, this pandemic. We're hoping to, to use philanthropy to make it uh, a little easier on folks. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for into the, the next um, fiscal year. Um, and then like I said, I'm the, the development lead for our college. Uh, Chris and I work closely together to set uh, the vision of, of development for the college and kind of our um, funding areas. We're also developing a board, um, an advancement board moving into 2020, um, and they'll be helping with this as well. <clears throat> and then um, I also serve as the, the department liaison. So if you have um, maybe a, a web page that you're looking to fundraise for on a um, smaller scale, I can help. Um, get you in contact with the people in the advancement office who, who make those things happen. Um, my role is major gifts, which is $25,000 or above um, in philanthropic giving. So um, that's kind of my focus area, but I, I have the contacts in the advancement office to um, help with other areas of giving. So please, please use me as a resource in that way. Um, so this uh, slide talks a little bit about um, what our goals are in, in fiscal year 21. Um, last year, our goal was also 45 million for the university scale. Um, we scooted by at uh, 46 million, uh, which was really exciting because from, from March to the end of June, we were in a pandemic and we, we weren't sure what that would do to philanthropy. Um, so we were able to meet our goal last year and hoping to, to hit the $45 million mark again um, this upcoming year. Um, and the QCNR fundraising goal for the college is a million dollars. Um, so it's, it's scaled for co per college. So the chart that you see on your screen um, is the last five years and then this, this current year. Um, and the chart only shows new gifts in each fiscal year. So when somebody um, wants to give a million dollars to the college um, and it's pledged out maybe for five years, the million dollars is counted in the year that it's uh, pledged. 
So this is just new money that's coming in. Um, where if you, you'll see our annual report here in a few days. Um, last year, the college uh, had about $1.4 million. Um, and that includes pledges and, and gifts that were realized in those years. So last year, uh, we saw a little bit of a dip um, because we didn't have a development person for, for part of the year. And then I came in. Um, and then this year, the, the running tally is about uh, 432000 So we're, we're on track to meet our goal um, this year as well. And this chart uh, for, let's see, fiscal year 20, uh, we had 268 gifts from uh, 191 unique donors. So we haven't seen so far this year or through um, March a huge dip in philanthropy. Um, if anything, it's moved maybe from... Um, from areas, so a lot of people giving to the Student Emergency Hardship Fund um, or more needs-based areas than maybe their traditional giving. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of the folks that I work with. Um, these are only the alumni of the college, so this doesn't account for foundations that I work with, um, corporations, um, people who aren't necessarily alumni, but maybe natural resources are a passion area of theirs. Um, but alumni, we have about 7,000 alumni in the world, uh, 6,500 that are in the United States, um, and then around 4,000 of those have a giving capacity of at least $25,000. So really that, that 4,000 are the folks that um, I'm meeting with and um, are, are giving those major gifts to the, the college and the university at large. So this next slide shows you kind of a heat map of where our alumni are located. Um, it makes a lot of sense. A lot are kind of in the, the mountain west and then the, the coastal west. Um, Alaska has quite a few and then um, some policymakers on the, the east coast. Um, so in a, a normal time, uh, I would be traveling to these different regions and, and meeting with alumni. Um, if you have conferences in these areas or you'll be traveling to these areas, it's helpful for me to know. Um, a lot of alumni like to meet with with faculty and, and the leaders in the field um, and, the, and the people who are doing the research. So, um, or if you know somebody who's in one of these areas that um, is interested in giving to, to the college or the university, um, please, please let me know and we can uh, make that happen. All right, next slide. Um, hold on. Um, yeah. Peter would like to know if you can update anything about the Student Hardship Fund. Yeah, so the last that I've heard on this, the university-wide student emergency hardship fund um, is that it had been opened up to three different rounds of um, grant cycles, where I think traditionally we only have one, and since March we've done three. Um, so folks can still donate to that. Um, if you search on the USC website, student emergency hardship fund, um, it should take you to that web page with a running tally. Um, we're now looking at having each unit or each college having their own student emergency hardship fund. Um, generally, donors have a lot of affinity to the college that they graduated from, so we, we think that we would see higher um, donation rates if we were able to say that we're giving them specifically to um, College of Natural Resources students. Um, so, so the student emergency hardship fund is still happening, um, and hopefully we'll have an update in the next few months um, on, on a college-specific one. Um, and then Claudia, it looks like, asked, is uh, how is the giving capacity determined? Great question. A little bit um, big brothery, maybe. Uh, so there's a whole research team in um, the advancement office who, um, I guess, has access to data on where these people are living, um, estimates from the job information that we have on them, which a lot of this is offered up from alumni as they're updating their information with us. Um, I don't know the exact algorithm, um, but we just kind of get a, a, um, a range of what this person might be able to, to gift. And it looks like Terry has, what percent of QCNR faculty and staff give back to the college? Is this a number that's important for development purposes? Um, we have a pretty small number of, of staff and faculty that give back to the college. Um, there are options to, to do like a payroll deduction. Um, we see a lot of staff doing um, planned or estate gifts um, in the college, um, but it's, it is important for development numbers and purposes. It's, um, it's a number or a figure that you can show saying that uh, our staff believe in what we're doing enough that they're, they're giving back. Um, 
so that's that's something that I would love to kind of dive into with folks and um, talk about how we can bolster that side of, of philanthropy within our college. Okay, uh, this next slide, this is just kind of a um, overview of areas that are impacted by philanthropy in our college right now. Um, student scholarships, that's kind of one that uh, people are probably the most familiar with. Um, we had 77 scholarships in uh, 2020 that we were able to award. It's about 10% of our, our student population. Um, student internships and professional development, that's kind of working to bolster students' resumes as they graduate. Um, and donors will fund, fund those areas, whether it's a travel budget or um, paying for half of the salary for a student. Uh, we have a few endowed chairs. The Quinney Library has benefited, whether it's the, the Mason Wildlife Exhibit um, or the, the Quinney's helping the college. Um, and then a lot of faculty research that's been funded. And the faculty research is an interesting area because um, oftentimes there's kind of a, a nice mixture that we can do with sponsored programs and then um, a philanthropic donation. So the, the person who's giving is able to get the, the tax benefits of the, the philanthropic donation and um, the, the research can also happen. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know and we can um, talk about making that work. All right, next slide. Uh, so these are just some an overview of some of the notable gifts uh, to the college in 2020. Um, a lot of these are listed in our annual report as well. So it's kind of, kind of nice. There's a little story with um, each of these people and they talk about why they chose to give back. So it kind of gives you a nice um, taste of philanthropy and, and why people do this. Um, probably a lot of you know Paul and Mary Holden uh, just uh, gave a really generous uh, gift in their estate. Um, an alumni uh, from Forestry, Robert uh, Wayand and his, his partner Andrea um, have a planned gift for a Forestry Scholarship. Um, Daniel Lean, who will be um, joining our board, um, he's a rec resource uh, management alumni. Um, and then Marilyn Reeves and her late husband have um, been funding undergraduate research for, for quite a few years now. Um, so you can read more about those in the annual report. Um, so the last slide is kind of just moving forward into 2021. Um, I'm looking forward to partnering with you all to, to develop support for our greatest needs um, in the next few years and, and seeing what that looks like. Um, the university will be moving into a, a capital campaign, which is our second capital campaign in history. Um, and it's a little bit of a um, different format than typical capital campaigns. Um, so we're calling it an impact campaign. Um, it was supposed to be launched this year around this time, but for, for obvious reasons, we've moved it to um, fall of 2021. Um, but the, the difference between a normal capital campaign and an impact campaign is that uh, a capital campaign would be focused on a dollar amount. So maybe the university would say, we're looking to raise um, $100 million in the next five years to this campaign. Um, but instead, we're focusing on impacts, uh, which I think is is a lot more appealing generally to donors. So the, the, the messaging would be more like, we're looking to have 30% uh, of QCNR students with a scholarship uh, each year, um, or something that's more focused on what the impacts will be. We're looking to have research institutes um, rather than a dollar amount. Um, so be looking for that in the next uh, year, and I'll be working with department heads and, and Dean Lukey to move that forward. Um, and part of that is the, the development board that we're creating. Um, so the college right now, uh, Dean Lukey and I are coming up with um, impact areas that our college will be working, working towards, um, kind of under the umbrellas of student support with undergraduate research, professional development, and summer internship funding, and then research and institute funds. Um, so we'll have kind of one pages on that um, that next year we can release and um, you'll get some more information about. Um, the last two things, just that it's a bit of a challenging philanthropic climate. Um, we haven't seen a huge reduction, like I've said, um, but we'll, we'll kind of see what the next uh, six months, a year look like. It's also an election year, which traditionally are, are, is harder to fundraise in. Um, so with that in mind, we're kind of focusing on a variety of different giving methods. There are many, many different vehicles for giving, whether it's planned giving, um, which is putting us in, in estate plans, um, gifting life insurance, property, uh, goods, all different sorts of things. Um, so we're focusing on, on, on that um, and kind of matching donors' passions with, 
what the university and, and the college are doing. Can I just um, see Terry's new question? Does the USU Development Office charge a management fee on all endowments regardless of the annual rate of return? Yeah, that's a great question. So you can you can look at the USU endowment management policy online, but it's essentially um, each endowment, uh, the first 4% that get, gets kicked off from the endowment goes towards the purpose. So in an ideal year, maybe we would have an 8% return on our investment. 4% goes to the, the use or the um, what the endowment is, uh, the purpose of the endowment. And then after that 4% has been met, 1.5% goes to university advancement as a management fee. And then anything above and beyond that goes back to the, the corpus and is reinvested. Um, so in an ideal year, we would have an additional amount to, to reinvest in all these, these requirements we met. In a year that it's low, uh, so maybe we, we have 2% back, um, it goes towards the purpose of the endowment. So we don't get the fee unless it surpasses that 4% mark. Um, and that, that fee goes towards keeping USU development running and then the management fee for the um, financial services that, that manage our endowments. Maybe we'll give another few seconds for um, questions to come in. Like I said at the beginning, I'm excited to meet all of you. If you have questions um, or a, a fundable idea, um, my email address and my phone number are on here, and I'd love to virtually meet or socially distance meet um, and hear what you guys are doing. So Emily, as a new person um, in this role, do you see things that we've been doing that aren't particularly effective and things that we do that are particularly effective? And how, how does that play out as a... Yeah. I was just throwing that one. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, yeah, I think I am always shocked with um, the amount of research that comes out of our college and uh, the quality and maybe the relatability relatability of um, the research. Um, so I think I would like to see more uh, marketing come out of our college because a lot of these alumni are really excited to see what you all are doing, what you're producing. Um, so I think maybe one way we could step up is advertising ourselves better because um, what you all are doing is amazing and our, our students are doing a lot of great things. Um, and I think something that we're doing well is that we're it's a close-knit community in this college, um, both from my perspective as, a, as an alumni and uh, now working here. So I think we have a really high affinity from the, the alumni that we're producing. Um, the vast majority of folks that I'm talking with um, have really fond memories of the folks that they learned from here, um, the, the QCNR community. Um, so I think the faculty and staff are doing a phenomenal job of um, making this a great place to, to learn and earn your degree, um, which, which helps philanthropy. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. But send me the great things that you're doing because it's, it's nice to be able to see those and to, to pass them along. Is there anything else? Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks, Emily. So we can go back to the webcam. Yeah, so um, thanks, Emily. Emily has been doing a great job in terms of connecting with lots of alums and bringing in new kinds of, um, of funding for, for different projects. So we really appreciate her work. And, and it's going to be a big change once I think we get an advancement board in place. So Sorry, stay tuned. Um, yeah. I can answer them on the chat. There's a lot dropping in. Um, Sunshine Brosi says, thanks so much, Emily, for a great presentation. I look forward to working with you to engage alumni. Terry Messmer says, can you provide a list of all endowments that are under QCNR? And Nancy Messner says, question for Shelley. How are we doing at increasing diversity, inclusivity in our undergraduate programs, and what can faculty do to help? Do you want to do that or do it later? Um, whatever I think you do. I can. Um, you know, with some of these things, I think what we're going to do is take the questions and we'll send something out on each of those. Um, in terms of increasing diversity, we've been um, working with a variety of programs to try to um, highlight our programs at things like SACNAS and, uh, and some of the diversity issues or 
groups that are in different things like the Ecological Society of America or, or ASLO or AGU. Um, we're going to start doing some other things, and, and Wild is going to talk a little bit about that at their retreat, but they're interested in doing some specific targeted Latinx recruitment, so you'll hear about that. But we'll, um, what we'll do with the questions is send out a more detailed information when we have to look some stuff up. So I'll get a sense of DWR funding, and I think there are some questions for Emily that she can, she can look up, and so, so that'll, that'll be great. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, what does the future hold? Well, I'm really not sure. I, I wish I knew. I was um, very pleased with how the faculty responded to the really rapid transition that we had to online learning for all of our classes in the in the spring semester last year. You guys did a great job. Um, I was expecting lots and lots of complaints to the dean's office from angry parents and students and that didn't happen at all so uh, so that was was your tremendous contributions and uh, as Shelley indicated we're, we're doing well in terms of student enrollment um, and all this year um, that being said COVID is still sort of driving the bus and so we're trying to figure out What's the best way to, to go about planning for the future? Again, I, I want to stress the idea that we need to be flexible in how we're going to deal with this because I'm certain that things are going to change. I did a quick scan of uh, the courses that we're offering, and it looks like about 70% of the course offerings in QCNR are either online or being broadcast. And so in some ways, if we do have to transition back to uh, completely remote learning modes, 70% uh, of, the, of the courses will be covered pretty well. The real problem is that the face-to-face -face and hybrid classes that we have are the classes that are sort of hands-on, lab-intensive, fieldwork oriented, and those are going to be more challenging. Uh, the fall is a big time for us to do fieldwork, and because of the weather, is, it tends to be so nice, and in the spring, that's a little bit less uh, less of a routine. So we'll we'll try to prepare for that as best we can and see what what happens. Um, one of the things that um, we know at the university there's going to be outbreaks of COVID and so the trick is what we're going to do is try to isolate those and and tamp them down before they spread to everybody. Um, USU is helping us in a variety of ways. Uh, the testing ability on campus is going to increase greatly. The vet diagnostic lab is um, prepared to do about 500 tests a day of students, and these will be free. And students, faculty, staff, um, whoever, anybody that thinks that they've been exposed can get signed up for a test. They're not quite ready yet, but they're right on the verge, and it seems like things are working well. So that's going to be something that will really help us. With the vet diagnostic lab test, they're looking at turnaround times for results of one day. So that'll be a, a tremendous help if, if all that um, falls into place. The university has also hired a lot of people to help with contact tracing. Um, what we need to do in terms of teaching courses is to not have the classrooms be the site where transmission of the virus occurs. And so that's going to occur when we have um, good mask wearing and good social distancing in all the classrooms. We have the classrooms set up to do that, and it should be um, something that happens. It's interesting that at the university level, uh, the way that our emergency response team is looking at this is that students are going to be considered in contact if they're exposed to a positive case at a distance of less than six feet for less than 15 or for more than 15 minutes. So it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out and hopefully that will give us good information on transmission of the virus and that um, that will keep the classrooms from being a source of things. The real problem we have and what's been happening at other universities is that it's been the, the living situations and the social situations that have been difficult to control. And my guess is that we're going to have 
uh, similar problems uh, with that here, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, next Wait, slide. Chris, yeah. There were a couple of comments. Oh, yeah. So, Stephanie Crabtree commented that um, she's glad to hear that there's few or no angry parent letters concerning the online teaching. And Claudia pointed out that the chart must include web broadcast. Yeah, if you go back to the chart, um, I, I lumped a lot of things. Um, so web broadcast is in the broadcast part, but hybrids were a bunch of different kinds of hybrids. So it gives you a little bit of a sense of that. Um, we did have, it's interesting, I, I got more bounce back from the president's office on a couple of people that were very concerned. But if they're writing to the president rather than me, that's a good thing from my perspective. But, <laughs> but also it, it means that that we're not really seeing that many people that are that are upset with us in our classes. It's more sort of some general um, issues, and, and we're trying to deal with those as best we can on a one and one one to one basis. Patrick also says um, the university will also be offering a COVID test that can get results back in 15 to 20 minutes, but it has a high false negative rate. The 24 hour turnaround test that Chris mentioned is PCR based, has very low false positive and false negative rate. Yeah, those are, and those are both good news. And I think what they're gonna do is do a, a lot of the rapid test. Um, and then they may have people that, uh, where things are unsure, go ahead and do the PCR test as well. Uh, I, Patrick, do you know anything about antibodies? I don't know. We'll see if he chimes back in on the chat. We can go to the next one, I think. Um, I was hoping that we could share with you all a new student code that's a temporary student code that's going in place during this period where the uh, COVID pandemic is affecting us. Um, this is a code that's going to um, define what students are responsible for doing in terms of mask wearing and social distancing, and so that should help us. Uh, the situation is that faculty members and instructors in classes, uh, if someone's not wearing a mask, we need to politely ask them, you know, please put a mask on. We're going to have extra masks in all the classrooms, or we'll have some in the dean's office that you can take if you don't if you're concerned about there not being enough in the classroom where you are um, teaching. Uh, hopefully that will solve the problem in, in a nice non-confrontational way. If people refuse to do that, we can report them. And the way that student reporting is going to work, they'll um, get a, a visit from someone about their behavior on the first time. And then after, if there is a second or third offense, they'll be uh, increasing uh, punishment and in, in, in effect for these these folks. If we do have um, class disruptions from people not wearing masks, we can call the campus police and they'll come and escort people out. And so there'll be a level of ways that we can deal with this. And hopefully we want to tamp things down, not, not accelerate any kind of um, disagreements. And, and we'll see how that goes. There hasn't been a, a ton of problems across the country, but but we'll see how that plays out. Uh, the other thing that's happening is the QCNR offices, department offices, and the Business Services Center need to be open for some part of the, of the time during each day. And so we're all working on plans to do that. That's only going to work if we let, um, if we all sort of help each other out and, and sign up for periods of time when we can do it. We realize that parents are under uh, additional stress because of the school system uh, and, and the kids in the schools have very funny hours, and so that may affect when you can work and when you can work at home. It's not good for us to have everybody come back. What we want to do, though, is staff the offices so that the offices can be open some a substantial part of each day, and, and the different groups are going to look at different kinds of, of hours. If we have employees that are uh, immunocompromised in some way, we can. There's other ways in which we can deal with workloads there that involve working from home or working on off hours. Um, each of the offices has a COVID standard operating procedure, and so people should look at that to get a good sense of, of what's going on. Um, 
Other things that are happening, the BNR South Wing remodeling project is getting launched. Um, there's no signed contract yet for either the construction company or the architects, but they're working on that now. It looks like the VCBO architects are gonna be the architects involved. They're the people that have done both the Life Sciences Building and the North Wing of, of BNR. And so that's good. They know us well and they work with us um, pretty well. What we're thinking is gonna happen and almost certainly is gonna happen is that the glazing on the north facing windows on the south wing are gonna be replaced first. Um, that'll be in conjunction with some work on the HVAC that'll happen at the, at the same time. But what that means is that the people that have offices on the north facing windows on the south wing of BNR are gonna to have to move those offices. Uh, the work is gonna start probably in February and hopefully end by September. Uh, if they don't find much asbestos, it'll actually happen before semester starts next fall. Um, so we'll see how, how that plays off until they get into it. They're not gonna know exactly. We've been working with the university to come up with additional office space and we have some uh, meetings scheduled and it's around the end of September to look at some of these office spaces where we can move some people. We're not gonna be able to find office spaces for everybody. So we need to know if people are willing to work from home during that period of time. There's a few people that are on sabbatical. If they're not gonna be using their offices, we need to know that. We'll probably have to move some grad students into research labs or other grad student bullpens and that sort of thing. But it'll be a little a flexible situation. We should have a plan in place by October. And so that's the goal for the, the movement in that location. Um, let's see, that looks like all of those. Karen, things. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Karen Mock notes, was asbestos found in the north wing of BNR? Um, yes, it was, and a lot of it was associated with the tile on the floor. And so we need to work with the architects. There's different ways to deal with that. If we put carpet on the tile, we don't have to um, remove it and cause the, the problem with um, mediation of that issue. So we'll, we'll talk with them and come up with some plans. What we're going to start this fall is a committee that deals, that interacts with the architects. There'll be four or five people that meet with the architects every week and we talk about a variety of different options. We're into a sort of a three stage, three year stage program. Uh, it'll be stretched out over time and this is the, the glazing on the north facing windows will be the first one. Um, you know, most of the time, they find asbestos, so that's what concerns me and probably concerns Karen as well. But it'll be certainly something that, uh, that we, need, we need to look at. Uh, let's see, and then next slide. So uh, one other thing we wanted to touch base on real quickly is um, budget cuts. We, were, we had to come up with 2.2% of our ENG budget to reduce, and this was an ongoing cut. It wasn't just a one-time cut. It amounted to $178,000 for the college. And we did a variety of different things. Um, Ricky and myself and the department heads got together and tried to work through these different sorts of things. Nancy Huntley as well. Uh, Shauna Levitt left her position, and we're not going to refill that. Instead, Tracy Hilliard is going to... Uh, fill in and do some of Shauna's duties. So that'll be a little bit of a transition and Tracy is gonna be really busy for a little while, so please be patient if you have other things going on with Tracy. Uh, Alan Kasprak uh, accepted a faculty position at Fort Lewis State in Durango and so he left and we used his position as part of the budget cut. Um, Shannon Belmont is taking over some of his duties as the GIS Consortium Director, and so that's happening. We had a variety of other things. We kind of finished things up with um, what's happening with the vacant position pool, so we had to reduce that a little bit. We have some negotiations going on in terms of these VSIPs, the Voluntary Separation Incentive Programs, 
And if those come through, then we will be able to fill back in the um, vacant position pool money. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. The consequences of these budget cuts are that we'll likely be not starting any new searches for faculty this coming year. Uh, we have the search that's ongoing for the new co-op uh, unit person, and that, that will go on, um, but we probably won't start anything else. And there'll also be some reduction in funding from the Dean's Office discretionary pool. We have the state, uh, the state um, provided budget cut, not provided, but the state gave us some budget cuts. Uh, the Quinney Foundation, and we've been chatting with them, and they're also concerned about their next pledged gift, and it might be a little bit less, so that might cause some problems. But we'll deal with those um, as best we can. Is there one more slide? The, probably the most important thing, and I realize I'm running out of time here quickly, is for people to get to know this USU COVID website. Uh, Brian, if you can go to that website, there's the URL on the um, business and are we there yeah okay we're only showing the first part of it but um, basically what it it allows you to do is look for recent updates and information and so that's really important along the top is also some incredibly good information for what happens if you've been exposed what happens if you are sick what happens if you travel and those sorts of things and so um, lots of information here. This is going to be. This is how the university is communicating with students, staff, and faculty in terms of what's going on. Um, the COVID questionnaire is what happens if you're sick or you're exposed. There's also some information on travel. And if, Brandon, can you go to university operations? I'm not sure I can drive this. Uh, it's right here. Okay. And scroll down to travel. There's all kinds of information on travel. This is either travel for university business or travel on your own. And if you scroll down in the travel page, you'll get to um, keep going a little bit more. There's a, uh, you can keep going, I think. Uh, quarantine, the travel questionnaire is something if you're traveling, you need to be aware of and to fill that out. And that's how the university is keeping track of whether people have gone to high risk places. So the most important thing, if we go back to the slides, is for us all to, to stay healthy and to try to help each other. And so hopefully everyone is, is able to do that. Uh, we'll try to communicate more frequently um, during the semester and keep everyone up to speed on what's happening with the COVID situation, but also what's happening in our courses, our research programs, and our extension programs. Okay, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and hang up now and let you guys have a few minutes to get ready for your, um, your department um, retreats. They're supposed to be starting in about 15 minutes. And we'll look through the live chats and, um, and get those uh, questions answered um, out to you. So thanks a lot for participating today, and uh, hopefully you have a very productive rest of the day. Thanks. Bye.